Hello and a warm welcome to you. Thank you for joining this webinar in our annual pensions conference series. Today we're looking at covenant and funding issues at a time when so much in the world has changed. My name is Richard Evans and I'm a partner in Mayor Brown's Pensions Group. I'm joined by my colleague Devi Shah, partner and co-head of our London restructuring practice. I'm very pleased to say we also have a guest speaker, Richard Farr, Managing Director at Lincoln Pensions. Richard is a leading advisor on DB Covenant matters. He acts for household name sponsors including GKN, John Mendes and Burton Foods. He also has huge experience of distress situations including complex transactions and scheme compromises. We're going to start by asking what the covenant and funding landscape now looks like, bearing in mind the impact of COVID-19, Brexit, and the increasing focus on ESG issues. We'll then look at recent and forthcoming changes in pensions and insolvency law. Finally, we'll consider a couple of case studies asking what are trustees and employers doing in practice? What should they be doing? Just a couple of housekeeping points before we start. If your slides stop moving along, please press the F5 key on your keyboard or refresh the page. Solutions to other common technical problems can be found in the help widget at the bottom of your screen. And with that, I'll hand over to Richard Farr to start the ball rolling. Real soft, we just don't know. We've got Biden coming in now saying that he needs to have a hard, any hard Irish border means there's no trade deal with the US. Uh, so it's complete uncertainty at the moment. But also the Trump factor we experienced in the last four years, the Chinese tr tr trade wars issue that affected a number of our global companies. Uh, that may have calmed down now, although it seems to see that the Chinese have not commented on the Biden victory yet. And we're not sure whether that's a positive or negative uh, reaction as well. Of course, COVID-19 is the big story of this year. No one predicted COVID-19, and yet no one also saw the second uh, lockdown as well. The idea of bounce back scenarios was well publicized during this year. Whether it was a W, a V, a hockey stick, a whoosh, a, a long curve, no one knew. But I think the double V that is coming through a bounce back uh, post the second lockdown is hopefully one that's going to be more certain. Having said that, the, uh, the first V recovery in the summer wasn't that great, was it? Uh, and unfortunately, it was, it was also short lived. The key that I've realized in the last uh, 40 years is to experience to deal with outlier situations, the so-called black swans. These are the things that no one thought of existed but have happened and have become more regular in recent years. I tried to look up what the collective noun for a black swan was. There isn't one, there's obviously a white swan, uh, but you've got words like bevy, drift, herd, whiteness. Uh, but I, I think clearly next year we have a, n a number of more black swans to experience. But what could be next? Around in UK sterling, like the old days, the, the, the years of the 60s, where sterling was seen as a very weak currency, who can bet against that? Remember hyperinflation, stagflation, no inflation? But what about the idea of negative interest rates? How do you discount a liability with a negative figure? And as you know, in pensions, it's all about discounting future cash flows with asset returns. If they're negative, what do you do about it? How do you value these, uh, these liabilities? My biggest fear, though, is the uncorrelated recovery of our trading partners. What I mean by that? Supposing our European partners come out more so than we do, their customers aren't buying our goods. Supposing we're left behind by Europe, for example, or other countries, as we struggled with our debt we've incurred through COVID. And I think the final question is the, the Donald legacy. This slide was produced before the election result. You may, I mentioned earlier Biden to you. You now know Biden's won, so we think. But what about the legacy of that whole incredible democracy in action in America? How will that play out next year? Can we rely on the, 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 our biggest uh, partner in the world being stable as well? So I think the key for me in the backdrop of this situation is expect the unexpected. to negotiate a, a strong view of covenant and therefore have minimized the funding strain on their business by convincing trustees to be more uh, less prudent in their assumptions. Of course, as the market changes, 
that prudency is challenged, especially when the, the forecast the employer was predicting haven't materialized. As a result, forget any black swan issues. A mere recognition of a wicked covenant by the trustee from previous valuations creates a bigger, a larger number. And that in itself creates volatility. As you can see from the diagram on the screen, the employer wants to pull you to the right-hand side to, to a stronger covenant to have a lower funding target. And clearly you as a prudent trustee would want to push it to the left-hand side. And it's that tension in negotiation which is, is finally balanced. And of course, at some point, when the covenant story becomes found out, potentially, that the trustees suddenly get a, a pull to the left-hand side to create a higher funding target. But hopefully it's not too late in that situation. We at Lincoln have nine points on our scale, and we allow, therefore, the covenant to be graded in, in, a, in a very precise way to allow employers and, and trustees to determine the exact nature of prudency in their assumptions. Um, and as you move from the stronger to the weaker, uh, you find that post the neutral situation into the weaker territory, things get accelerated quite quickly. And that's where trustees feel that it's running away from them because the, the covenant has suddenly weakened somewhat, but their TPs increase a lot more than somewhat in that situation. And this idea of a controlled watershed is interesting in the sense that trustees are getting more control at a time when the covenant is weakening. And although the control is, is, is achieved by having a higher funding target, Often you find that the control over what? A weak covenant is, is hard to control. A strong covenant generates cash. A weak covenant clearly can't generate cash. And therefore the, the new non-cash options start being discussed as trustees try and protect themselves against the weakening covenant at a time when the employer can't afford to fund a, high, a higher TP. It's this balance therefore which has been going for the last 15 years that's been held to account but I, I would suggest to you on this uh, webinar that the market behind this arrangement is much more volatile going forward. You saw on the previous slide the macro issues that can affect this dynamic. The good news I've found though in the last 15 years of doing this work is that the advisors, the employers, the trustees are getting smarter about the whole situation. So we're well prepared, I think, for the challenges. I believe if we'd had COVID five years ago, for example, I think uh, it would be a lot worse a situation than we are today. Trustees are much more uh, 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 aggressive on their monitoring. They're tight on their de-risking and their hedging. Employers recognize the power of the regulator and their own short-term gains have been not really been achieved. As a result, you have a lot more of a collective and mature funding negotiation going forward. And you'll need it because the next 12, 18 months the new paradigm we're going to be seeing will be very uncertain. And the old models, the old assumptions, the old uh, projections that have been tried and tested will be stretched beyond uh, a prior uh, precedent. So now we know the market in which we're operating under, the conditions which we're going to be facing next year. We understand also how covenant is um, calculated and how it can be volatile. But what deficit are you looking at to fund? Uh, when I got involved in pensions 18 years ago now for the first time, I asked a fellow actuary of mine, what is the answer to the question of the deficit? And he said there were seven answers. And I said, how can you have seven answers to the same question? And, and it reminded me of the seven dwarf conversation in that situation. And here's the seven dwarfs as they stand. On the left-hand side, dwarf one is the best estimate. That's, as you know, where you should be funding to your target to fund with no prudency at all. And that's the target to help the scheme get out of its deficit as well as the employer as well. On the right-hand side, column six, is the buyout deficit. That is a bookmark. Uh, that is a big number, as you all know. Hopefully, more are doing so as they move towards buyout, but it's still a big number. And clearly, why it's relevant to this conversation is it's such a big number compared to the number one, it's the risk that the employer is running with the scheme as opposed to an insurance company's risk. And that number, although it's very large, and it's not academic, it actually shows the price of eliminating the risk you're running as an employer. In between those two bookends are the number of deficits. The most important one, as you know, is, is the TPs. And that will swing left and right based on the covenant strength. Uh, clearly, an employer would like who is strong to have a lower TP, and a wicked covenant clearly drives the covenant to the right. But as you know, bizarrely, 
the weaker you are, the bigger number you have as a funding deficit, the less you can afford it, hence the conundrum that trustees face on a daily basis. The accounting deficit, column two, is irrelevant. Apart from information disclosure, apart from maybe some overseas investors who still review accounting as a debt-like obligation, I think we in the UK know it's an irrelevant number, and hopefully the profession one day realizes it as well. On column four, the swap rate, that is the price you want to de-risk the scheme to the capital markets, to your LDI products. And the fifth uh, column is the one we call self-sufficiency. Now that's been an interesting conversation recently because the TPR are encouraging sponsors to, uh, and, to, and trustees to discuss if the covenant was a light touch covenant reliance, what would be the deficit? I not buy out because it's too expensive, but what would a low risk basis be? There's been much debate about that basis for obvious reasons. Sponsors think it's uh, lower, um, the trustees think it's higher. But I think the TPR, through involvement on super fund guidance recently, has indicated a range between gilts flat to gilts plus a half could be seen as an acceptable range of being self-sufficient. Whether or not the super funds can price to that level, whether the insurance companies who are competing with super funds can move their models in the same basis, time will tell. But the new development of, of super funds, uh, and in general's new products, capital back solutions, synthetic covenants, are all part of the sophistication of the marketplace we're seeing develop as we price the deficit towards buyout but not to the big buyout question itself. We mustn't also forget column seven, the PPF deficit. Most people I, 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 I talk to in, in business aren't aware of the number. They're aware of the concept clearly, but never bother finding out what it is until they ask them to tell the number. This, as you know, is a number that the PPF is, is underpinning it for the trustees through the insurance lifeboat. And in particular, if trustees are looking at weak covenants, the PPF deficit becomes a very relevant figure about how, uh, how much above they are in that funding level. Because PPF underpins the, uh, the liabilities. And if trustees get more than the PPF deficit, what, what are they doing in their job for obvious reasons? I'd also add that the PPF deficit is the creditor that the PPF acts on behalf of in, in restructuring. I'm sure Debbie will cover that point more in detail as well in due course. So we have the seven deficits through the seven dwarf calculations. Which one is relevant depends on your agenda. If you're a strong covenant, you should be encouraged to de-risk and buy out or go through a super fund. If you're a weak covenant, you're monitoring that PPF level to make sure that you don't go beneath that for obvious reasons. And of course, the best estimate is your best hope. Try and make sure the scheme gets out on its own accord. But of course, in this current environment, the macro uncertainty around this, the investment assumptions, et cetera, that drive that best estimate are clearly volatile. And I think the most uh, damaged tool you can have now in the current market is the value at risk tool. That tool that's based on algorithms, based on previous correlations of the last 20 years of economic factors is surely now a busted flush because all the information that models feed off, whether it's pre or post credit crunch, pre COVID, pre Brexit, and now of course post the bounce back, those models clearly, whilst for one year VARs may be okay for insurance company purposes, using VAR for the three or five year projections, in my view, is a nonsense. So we need to find different tools to measure risk and to measure scenarios. So what is the answer to looking at risk and volatility looking ahead? If VAR is being challenged as, as a redundant tool from the 19th century, what can we do? What is the future? What is the answer? Of course, no one knows. Anyone who says they know is, is, is clearly not in the same planet as all of us, quite frankly. But the key is uh, that TPR encourages to look at is scenarios. Let's stress test the models. Let's see how far things need to go wrong and see what happens to the scheme and the employer. So we're finding a lot more monitoring and scenario testing for our clients. And what if we have the high inflation, for example? What if there's a growth surprise, a bounce back that's better than we thought? Can the trustees take advantage of that bounce back without the constraints of the employer limiting their actions? What about low growth? What about zero inflation, negative, negative inflation, for example, as well? So the key on this slide is to look at stressing the impossible that was impossible before is now possible going forward. Uh, we've seen through, through COVID that 
previous 10% reduction in revenue assumptions, which have been a standard uh, recipe for any accountant doing scenario planning over the last 20 years, has been made redundant by COVID. We're looking at 25, 33%, even 100% revenue drops in certain situations. No one would have predicted that situation, clearly. But how did the company survive? Well, clearly, no one also predicted government support for obvious reasons. And that, again, gave an underpin. So some clients that I've been involved with, for example, the insolvency test has been passed with flying colours by government support. And it hasn't helped profit, clearly, but it's helped uh, the insolvency risk go away because government have declared their hand. So what sectors are at risk that are more important than others to look for? Well, obviously, the retail sector, clearly, through its acceleration of digitalisation, has been made worse by COVID. Um, tourism, you've seen, no doubt, the travel industry has been really decimated by the process. You saw today, maybe, uh, this is a, a 9th of November uh, presentation, the market's bounced back by 30%, 40% today in some sectors because Pfizer announced a vaccine that could be available for Christmas, for example. The volatility of this uh, marketplace is quite extraordinary. How are you as trustees, therefore, prepared to allow for this extreme rise? The key is to sit down with the employer, look at their own plans for high-risk scenarios, if they haven't got one, then be very worried. If they've got one, let's share that conversation. Let's test their extreme reactions. Let's test the schemes also but to react to those situations and do what-if scenarios. The key I find at TPR of stress is not is doing the right thing to get the right answer, but doing the right thing in process. Get the audit trail sorted out. Look at the extreme scenarios across a credible range of scenarios and document your thoughts. Make sure you have a clear path of, if that happened, what I would do about it. And then document that process, and hopefully you have to never use it. But then, of course, you monitor the situation. What are the warning signs that are, are going towards that kind of extreme situation? So as part of the uh, scenario planning, not only thinking of the scenario itself, but also thinking through the parameters which indicate it's coming around the corner. Now, clearly, that can also be hard as well in itself. It's not obvious sometimes, these situations, but there are certain markers, whether you have a listed uh, uh, group, for example, there are debt pricing you can use. And even just Google is a useful tool to have news alerts to spot key sensitivities for your employer covenant changes, which gives you a heads up about the future. So good luck on scenario planning. You'll find it quite interesting You'll need an interactive workshop with your employer and your advisors, but you'll find it actually very rewarding to make sure you can understand how durable your employer is and your scheme is. Clearly, um, Covenant was seen to underpin the risk journey, but what risk is there when you're well-funded? Surely the, the scheme itself can get out by itself without regard to the employer's own covenant? And that could be true, of course, but we don't know with this scenario planning you've just looked at on the previous slides whether the employer could be okay in under certain scenarios. What we've identified here are three factors that you as trustees, you as employers, need to be aware of about your covenant journey within your journey plan. First of all, the, the, the classic question of affordability. How much can the scheme uh, demand from the employer uh, to fund its uh, path to buy or to path to do risking, path to long-term funding targets. That affordability debate is clearly crucial here. And the ability of a CFO to demonstrate their forecasts are affordable or not is clearly a, a massive negotiation for trustees to, to, to establish as well. We identify affordability as either high, neutral, or constrained. Clearly, at the moment, with the post-bounce post back scenario, I would argue even well-rated covenant stories that will be constrained. Why? Because they're preparing for the bounce-back opportunities. Their, their competitors, for example, have been struggling. There's a chance to buy them. They've had cost cutting through furlough. They've reassessed their cost base. They want to trim it further before they have a lean burn bounce-back scenario as well. This all involves cash. Also, and thirdly, perhaps most importantly, the way in capital that's been unwound in the last six or to eight months through, through COVID will now be wound again. And you'll find that the cash they've generated from their, their wing capital that's funded their short-term cash will suddenly go back into the balance sheet. So don't expect trustees to have a cash-rich, strong employer in the short term. 
either because they won't be, because of the reason I've told you, or because they want to spend it on something else to, to grow their covenant. So it's good news that an employer comes to you, trustees, with a story of growth, but it unfortunately involves a little cash to you, maybe as a scheme uh, demander. That's the first factor. The second factor is visibility. How visible is the covenant over the next three to five years? We've debated in the past how long covenant can be relied upon, and clearly certain covenants are more reliable than others. Unfortunately, what we found from this presentation is whatever you thought was reliable is less reliable going forward, and the visibility of that covenant story is key. Is it stable? Can you see a clear path of covenant? It may not be a good story, but is it visible, for example? If you are in a, in a situation where, for example, in, in newspapers, where you're going to digital from, from paper, you know it's a, a long-term decline or a short-term decline, but at least it's visible, and actually it's quite stable in that decline. You can work with it. Is it uncertain? Is it volatile? And the third factor is reliability. Once you can see a covenant story, how reliable is it? The sectors you're into at the moment, how reliable are those sectors to challenge and change? Are they a winner or a loser? As we all know, unfortunately, most DB schemes are legacy from the old economy industries, and new, new businesses tend to not have defined benefit schemes. As a result, by definition, the sectors that you're in are going to be challenged, and the demise of those sectors could either be inevitable in the next three to five years or even in the next 10 years. How can you have a journey plan of less or more than those periods if your reliability or covenant can't reconcile to that journey plan as well? So these covenant factors help the trustees unravel the underlying dynamics at play with the covenant structure in determining your, your overall funding strategy and your journey plan. It's, a, it's an interesting journey to do this, of course, and the covenant is key to underwrite that risk, that shortfall, and that story. I'm now going to hand over to Richard now, who will look at the relevant changes in the pension law and regulations against this backdrop. Over to you, Richard. Thanks, Sir Richard. When we look at pensions law and regulation, actually I think we find that remarkably little has changed in response to the pandemic and the economic downturn. We do have the guidance from the pensions regulator, which it issued when the pandemic broke, and which said that short-term contribution holidays could be agreed on a light-touch basis, which was helpful. And the regulator has also said it will be sympathetic to longer-term changes to recovery plans subject to conditions as to justification, mitigation where possible, and equitable treatment. But otherwise, as I say, we haven't really seen much of a regulatory response to the pandemic. The scheme funding regime remains much as it was. And furthermore, both the government and the regulator have said that they're going to push ahead their long-standing proposals to beef up the regime. So over the next year or two, we're likely to see new requirements for all trustees with employer agreement to introduce long-term funding targets and the introduction of the regulator's twin-track approach to demonstrating compliance, whereby schemes can opt either for a fast-track approach, provided they tick specified boxes, or their own bespoke approach which will be subject to careful regulator scrutiny. Now, against the background of the pandemic and downturn, it seems to me this is going to be challenging. The proposed long-term objective, funding objective, must be a good thing, but trustees will find themselves having to set or revisit their objectives at a time when the future has never been more uncertain. As to the regulator's twin-track approach, it remains to be seen whether its boxes, the fast track, allow for the new economic normal. If they don't, an awful lot of schemes may be forced to take the bespoke route. There are also the proposed new regulator powers against employers and others. First of all, the regulator will have power to impose contribution notices on employers where either an employer insolvency test or an employer resources test is met. This potentially opens the door to regulator intervention wherever a transaction leaves an employer weaker, either on an insolvency basis or subject to a materiality test on a going concern basis. 
And then there's a proposed new criminal offence of conduct risking accrued benefits. Employers and others may face jail if involved in an act which has a substantial adverse effect on the chances of members receiving the benefits payable. The direction of travel here is obvious. Employers will need to tread more carefully when it comes to pensions. But just how, caref but just how carefully, we don't know. We'll have to await guidance from the regulator as to how its new powers will be exercised. For the time being, at least, this is yet another uncertainty with which employers have to contend. What we're seeing among many of our clients is that they are targeting or indeed have achieved a self-sufficiency basis. So uh, the idea, as uh, Richard Farr mentioned, is that investments are substantially de-risked and that the scheme should be fully funded on that de-risked basis so that there is minimal reliance on the employer covenant. I say minimal, but of course, the employer will still be on the hook under Section 75, and a self-sufficient scheme may still have a significant Section 75 deficit. You'll remember um, this was apparent from uh, Richard's Seven Dwarfs. So schemes may end up in the slightly odd position, whereby on the one hand they are self-sufficient, Yet on the other, the employer retains a substantial, albeit contingent, liability. One imagines that with the economic downturn, an increasing number of trustees will conclude that they will never be able to achieve full funding on a buyout basis. One possible option in such cases is consolidation, transferring assets and liabilities to one of the DB super funds. Now, if one takes a step back and looks at DC consolidation, actually, I think that's been one of the big successes of the last couple of years. We as a firm have seen lots of standalone DC schemes transferring into master trusts with the advantages that they bring in terms of governance and economies of scale. Of course, DB consolidation is a lot trickier. That's because of the associated issues as to funding and covenant which we're looking at today. Effectively, the transferring scheme gives up its employer covenant in return for the super fund's capital buffer plus perhaps a one-off contribution. As to that, the regulator has recently published guidance both for super funds themselves and for trustees and employers who are considering the super fund option. But as yet, we have no legislation specifically directed at super funds. The government abandoned its plan to provide for a statutory framework in the Pension Schemers Bill. That, as it turned out, was just a few months before the start of the pandemic and the economic downturn. With the benefit of hindsight, it feels like an opportunity missed. So that's my uh, roundup of relevant changes to pensions law. Uh, Devi, what about the insolvency side of things? Thanks, Richard. Uh, we've also had some relevant changes to insolvency law that our clients in the sector need to be aware of. So in June 2020, the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020 came into force, and this introduced two new restructuring tools. The first of these is a standalone moratorium to give companies relief from creditor action while they seek to restructure. Now, unlike administration or liquidation, which are existing insolvency processes, the standalone moratorium won't trigger any Section 75 liability. And importantly, it gives the company an automatic payment holiday, including in relation to things like deficit repair contributions or any Section 75 debt that has already been triggered. But whilst the company has a payment holiday in relation to certain of those liabilities, it will be obliged to continue to make other payments, including in relation to bank debt. So effectively, those kinds of liabilities are going to have priority while the moratorium is in force over pension liabilities. The second of these tools is a new restructuring plan which will allow a company to split creditors and shareholders into classes and vote on the restructuring proposal. But, and this is the important thing, 
where not all classes have to vote in favor of the plan for it to become binding. So what's been introduced into the arena is this concept of cross-class cramdown. Um, an example of um, how this might be relevant in, in our scenario would be where bondholders vote through a plan which is detrimental to the scheme, such as where key parts of the business on which a scheme's covenant depends is moved to a new co. In situations like these, the interplay with TPR's proposed new moral hazard powers are going to come very much in, particularly if they are enhanced as is currently proposed and as Richard has just been describing. Um, the other things that I wanted to pick up on that have been introduced this year include temporary restrictions on statutory demand and winding up petitions. This might be relevant, for example, where a sponsor is not paying to find, uh, sorry, DRCs and the trustees and the company are locked in negotiations regarding the terms on which contributions are to resume. Trustees may not be in a position at the moment to threaten to wind up the sponsor in order to encourage them to come to the table so you, you may well have less leverage in current circumstances. And finally, the return of crown preference. Effective December 2020, HMRC is going to have priority status on insolvency in respect of certain debts that are um, collected at source, such as PAYE, employee NIC, and VAT. Now, in some recent insolvencies, the VAT and other tax bill have been very significant. And so this may mean that there are lower recoveries for unsecured creditors, including pension trustees and the PPF. Debbie, there's some major changes here. Have you seen many examples of this being used? Uh, there's certainly been um, a few restructuring plans. I'm only aware of a couple of standalone moratorium cases, but they've been relatively small and discreet, and I'm, I don't believe they've had any pension elements to them. In relation to the restructuring plans, we've seen the likes of Virgin um, Atlantic and Pete's Express propose them. Now, none of these situations have involved um, these plans being used to the detriment of pension schemes, but I, I do think it's very important for everyone to understand these options are out there, um, whether you're um, on the trustee side or on the company side. And, you know, that's one of the other really interesting things about the scenario that you're in at the moment. If there is an element of distress, the negotiation, the discussions are not now just between the trustees and the sponsor. There are a lot of other stakeholders who will be involved, whether directly or indirectly, in deciding what the ultimate outcome of any negotiations are going to be. So just um, picking up on that, well, I don't think we can say that legislative reforms are significantly impacting or changing behaviours in the pension sector. There is no doubt um, that employers and trustees are having to react to the pandemic and the economic impact of that and the other factors at play. So I'm going to look first at um, sponsors and, and how they might be responding well, clearly liquidity is a key issue because incomes have dried up. And sponsors, not only in addition to holding on to cash, have been raising equity on the capital markets, leveraging up, and they've done that by drawing down fully on any commitments they already had, issuing bonds, and accessing government and state loans. They've also been cutting costs. When it comes to employees, of course, we've seen furlough, we've seen rounds of redundancies, unfortunately, being announced, and we've seen other sorts of arrangements like reduced hours. When it comes to the supplier side, payments to suppliers have undoubtedly been significantly slowed, compromises have been reached, and orders, where possible, slashed or cancelled. <laughs> 
landlords have also been particularly vocal and particularly hard hit. They have agreed to rent deferrals, to cuts, to changes to turnover rents. And where they haven't agreed to these, they've been forced through, forced to through company voluntary arrangements. Um, I say forced to, of course, many of these actually have been voted in through very high percentages in favour, although we are seeing a couple of legal challenges being mounted by landlords who maybe have had enough. Richard, was there anything else that you wanted to add to this? Yeah, thanks, David. My biggest concern is everyone's held their breath the last nine months to try and get through this awful scenario. And they've actually used all their spare cash, their spare capacity, their spare cost-cutting um, of the facilities. And I think the second lockdown is a major concern for me. Because as you go into next year, how long will it last? I mean, as you said, the furlough has gone to March. That was a bit of a surprise, wasn't it, for a one-month lockdown? I think the government know more than they're letting on in terms of what, what, how, how the winter could, could run out. So I think my worry is, is if there's an, a prolonged situation here, what else can these sponsors do? And I think the issue is not much, quite frankly. So those who actually are healthy have held their breath for a while can go a bit longer. Those that actually were already terminal fundamentally, this would be their death knell. It's the ones in the middle are the issue. Those that are, potentially were okay, but are a bit delicate. Could this be the final nail in the coffin? And that's my biggest concern. Yeah, that, that doesn't surprise me at all, and, and I agree with you. So what about trustees? Uh, what should they be doing, and how should they be responding? I think it's really important to identify where they are on their cycle. Are they on a demise curve with their employer? Are they on an end game de-risking curve with their employer? And my next slide will, will show how to identify where you are. So, with all this uncertainty, what should trustees do about the situation? Well, the first thing is to understand where you are in the economic cycle, both in the short term, medium and long term. You'll see on this presentation I've given you, there are four zones I identify that are increasingly going to polarize the situation for you as trustees. The good news is if you're in the comfort zone, your scheme is a creditor. It's all about capital allocation. It's about fine-tuning the covenant and monitoring and planning your path to being self-sufficient, as Richard referred to earlier, or even the gold-plated buyout nirvana. Unfortunately, I believe only one in five plans are in that place in, in, in the UK. Most are not in that fortunate situation. The concern zone is where, in my opinion, the buyout deficit is more than the enterprise value of the employer group. And I think, unfortunately, over 40% of the plans in the UK are in that area. Because that's, why that's important is because the trustees have to allow the employer to grow, otherwise the, 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 the risk that the scheme is placing on the employer could ultimately crush the employer itself. And that means cash allocation is king. The marginal pound, should it be to the scheme? Should it be an investment? Should it be a work in capital? And dare I say, should it pay for the shareholders to, to encourage them to do future rights issues, as Debbie mentioned earlier? That, that whole dynamic of a partner status as well as a creditor is an important one. And as advisors, you have to recognize, along with your client, where you are in that situation. Is there asset security? If there is, take it. Is there extra upside? If there is, let's take it. Not just dividend sharing here. I'm talking equity. I'm talking equity options. If you're going to back the turnaround plan as trustees, where's your reward in that journey? The third zone is the crisis zone. This is where, in my opinion, the buyout deficit is more than twice enterprise value. In my experience over the last 15 years, there's no way the employer will ever get out of the buyout deficit obligation. As a result, the trustees have to act like owners. They own the business. They look at the turnaround plans of the business and give it support. But how do they time their involvement? Should they restructure the group as part of Debbie's sort of solution on the previous slide? Right. In particular, we're looking at PPF Plus here. Should the trustees maximize the return in now and cut their losses or roll the dice with the employer's turnaround plan? How does the PPF get involved? Are they going to be involved in that conversation? Certainly the TPR will be involved, but any form of compromise with the scheme liabilities has to have TPR involvement. The TPR are not um, 
uh, averse to this conversation. I've done many deals in this area over the last 15 years. And unfortunately, with the, 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 the environment looking ahead of, of massive uncertainty, more employers will, will have to put their hand up and say, you know what, I can't go on. So as a trustee team, you have to turn your mentality to being owners and allocating the capital of the group to your satisfaction, but also managing your own scheme dynamic in the same context. The final zone is catastrophe. And unfortunately, in my opinion, that's when the buyout deficit is more than three times the enterprise value of the, of the employer itself. You can't even get above PPF levels here, and you're into level PPF uh, compromise territory. There's still value there because you, as a PPF partner, have to maximize your return to the PPF in that regard, although the PPF now will become the principal here in all the negotiations, in all the restructuring process, in all the CBAs that Debbie referred to earlier. There'll be clear regulatory intervention by the TPR. They've been looking for moral hazard issues from the past. Look out for the last six years' events. It could be assets for the TPR to extract to help them fund the scheme shortfall. But that situation is clearly one of the specialist control. So in the last two zones, I estimate that one in five plans are in the crisis zone and one in five are in the catastrophe zone. You'll be pleased to know that most of the smaller schemes, though, are in the smaller zone. So the larger schemes, generally speaking, are towards the left-hand side of the presentation, and the smaller schemes are to the right, albeit there are notable exceptions, such as Carillion, such as BHS, for example. They were not small schemes. The key, therefore, is to ask your own advisors, what is the PPF deficit? What is the enterprise value of the business? What is my buyout deficit? How realistic is my enterprise value going to grow to fund that liability? If the answer is you can't, consider which zone you are in. Now, that's the theory, by the way. Let's now turn to some case studies, which are hypothetically mixed the reality of various clients that Debbie and I have worked on in the last six or 12 months. Thanks, Richard. So in this first case study, we are looking at a distressed business in the leisure sector. Before 2020, it was a successful business with a history of year-on-year -year growth and a strong covenant. Because of the sector that it's in in particular, it's in the eye of the COVID-19 storm and has ended up having either no or dr drastically reduced income and being potentially or actually in breach of various covenants under its existing and new debt facilities. What does that mean? Well, covenants are reviewed periodically under the documentation the companies enter into. And whenever there is an actual or impending breach, the company has to go out and negotiate waivers, and waivers often come at a cost. That in turn means that they are constantly in a cycle of being on a knife edge, because any time a waiver isn't given, that may lead to a default that could bring down the whole pack of cards. How might the group respond? But in, well, really in the ways that we've been talking about. So raising secure debt, um, raising equity, cutting costs. If the RCs are payable, it may seek a payment holiday, may have already done so, may have done so more than once. What about the scheme? Well, from the scheme's perspective, all of a sudden, it faces a potentially nil recovery from an insolvency because of the dramatic fall in the value of the assets, reflecting where the sector is, and the secured debt that's now ranking ahead of it. What might the trustees ask be in that situation? Well, First off, they might be looking for mitigation for the dramatically worse position the scheme finds itself in with a sponsor with a weaker covenant and the secure debt that's been layered in ahead of the trustee's claim. The trustees might be looking for an immediate cash injection. You want cash into the scheme, perhaps as a bridge to a position where they can explore the kinds of options that both Richards have been talking about um, for securing benefits in full or close to full without reliance on the sponsor in the long term. In addition, 
uh, one of the things that the trustees may have their eye on is that there is now a potential Section 75 deficit. And even if they can have some cash injected into the scheme, they might be looking for some kind of security or escrow arrangement to be put in place to give them comfort that the Section 75 deficit will be covered off or covered off as best can be, um, at least until the covenant of the company improves when there might be um, agreement to release any such security or other arrangement. Now, that's all um, great from the point of view of, of the trustee, but what about the company? All of this is incredibly challenging for companies uh, for all the reasons we've been discussing. And actually, there's another dynamic that we're finding in play at the moment. I mean, one of the things that's, that's perhaps a little unusual about the current situation is that really bad things are happening to really good companies. And distress is novel and unfamiliar to the boards that are currently having to deal with it. And perhaps you know, some, some of what we're seeing is a bit of denial that there's anything other than a short-term issue. And that's a very natural response. I think the, the other main challenge is that cash is the last thing that they want to hand over. And additionally, because of all the arrangements they will have entered into, so new facility agreements, new secured lending, uh, intercreditor arrangements, actually granting security to the trustees may be legally very difficult for companies. Um, and even if they can get over the legal hurdles, they've got to persuade all the other stakeholders that have now become involved to agree that it should be given. Richard Evans this time, if I can turn to you. For trustees that are locked in a negotiation of this kind, what should they bear in mind from a legal point of view? And what sort of tools and levers might they have to help them work through a successful negotiation? Well, let's start with the trustees' duties in this situation. Um, the trustees have a fiduciary duty to further the purposes of the scheme. We know that from the, the 2015 Merchant Navy case. And the main purpose of almost any pension scheme will be to secure the accrued benefits of members. So from that, uh, I think it's obvious what question the trustees need to ask themselves. How best can we ensure that benefits are ultimately delivered? Um, so once the trustees are clear as to their duties, they need to ask themselves what they can or should actually do. And for us as lawyers, that starts with a balance of powers analysis. So under the trustee rules and under legislation, what levers can the trustees pull? And which entities within the corporate group are potentially on the hook? Trustees will then need covenant advice so they can assess what value the levers can deliver in practice. And investment might, advice may also be needed uh, because remember trustees will always have power to change investment strategy unilaterally, subject only to prior consultation with the sponsor. This would also be the time, if uh, it's not, not already been done, to check the small print of any guarantees or special purpose vehicles put in place in the past. What recourse do those arrangements give the trustees in a distressed situation and against whom? The issues uh, here as will be obvious from what I've just said are multifactorial. So the trustees' different advisors will need to work together to identify the best or least worst option. Time is, of course, going to be of the essence. But remember that trustees' decisions could well be scrutinized by members by the regulator or indeed by other creditors. So it's important to get the process and the audit trail right. At that point, uh, perhaps a, a question for, for Richard Farr. Um, what view is the regulator going to take of all this and how best do trustees manage the regulator in this process? Thanks, Richard. I think your point about the process and audit trail is absolutely key. 
I mentioned earlier that the, there's no right answer in painting at the moment, given the uncertainty, but actually documenting what you've done and why you've done it and who you've taken advice from is absolutely fundamental to this. The GPR are very actively involved at the moment, as you've seen in, in, in recent cases. And whether you're an employer side or a trustee side, I've actually welcomed the TPR's involvement. They've got a clear mandate to, to, to gear up their process. Their supervisory teams are much more uh, focused on the issues involved, and their enforcement team are ready to pick up the actual next phase of any uh, conversation. Uh, what I've found, the TPR are very supportive of trustees in asking the right questions. I think the old legacy attitude from corporates, well, the TPR are all bluff and no real fact, is de definitely changing. And we've seen cases where TPR have acted within months of issuing warning notices, for example, in certain situations. And they've been very specific and directive in their correspondence, which is very welcome, I think, to both sides, albeit annoying for the employer sometimes. Uh, clear regulatory involvement with rationale and, and logic is, is actually, I think, a theme that everyone's actually seeing coming through in the marketplace today. So I think, and next year with the new code coming through and the, and the new pension bills you referred to earlier, Richard, uh, I think there's been a lot more scrutiny and accountability in this next 12 or 18 months of activity. I'm going to now also look at another case study, which actually isn't in a distressed area, but more in the, um, the end game area, but actually it did start in a potential distress situation. This is an example of a very interesting case where um, we had a classic overseas listed parent who wanted to get out of a non-core activity globally, and that included the UK also business model. Non-core had also had a DB legacy to it, as usual, and we had battle-hardened trustees who weren't professionals but very experienced who saw it coming. They embedded into the actual scheme arrangement overseas guarantees, parent support, plus, more importantly, closure triggers. So they were well, well armed for any potential uh, closure of the UK. In this situation, the company offered a deferred buyout with tepid guarantees to encourage the trustees to act in, under that guarantee ar arrangement from a synthetic offshore covenant. And that was being well developed at the time when COVID happened. That clearly affected the sales process globally. And as a result, everything was put on hold. What was interesting was the employer had gone through a very steep learning curve about pension risk and decided, given what, he, what he, they had experienced, they wanted to actually get rid of the scheme anyway in that process. And despite the, 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 the no need to fund to an end game process under their UK obligations, they, they got group support to have, look to an end game um, process here. And they're now looking at pricing super funds the legal in general ISS ABP products, the capital back solutions, and also looking at runoff with other synthetic covenant providers. I think this is a good example of dynamic learning curve, understanding the risk attached to both sides, and creating a proper solution in the uncertain life we're seeing going forward. I now want to hand over to Richard to sum up. So. For sponsors, and therefore for trustees, things have changed radically over the last 12 months, and they don't look like settling down any time soon. In many cases, the outlook is more gloomy than it was before. In almost all cases, it's more uncertain, and that's a big challenge when it comes to funding decisions and covenant assessment, both of which involve forming a view as to the future. While the world has changed immeasurably, not much seems to have changed on the regulatory front. We've had some encouraging noises from the regulator about being flexible and pragmatic within the existing legal framework. But otherwise, there's a feeling that the authorities are playing catch up. The government and the regulator are still working to implement changes first mooted a couple of years ago. The good news is that the industry is well placed to rise to these new challenges. We're seeing an increased professionalization of trustee boards, independent trustees who've been there before when it comes to weak covenants and distressed situations, and new options emerging for schemes where buyout is unattainable in the shape of super funds. And last but not least, hugely experienced covenant advisors 
and pensions and restructuring lawyers who can help trustees and employers navigate these difficult new waters. That seems like a good note on which to end. So that brings us to the end of today's webinar, which forms part of our annual pensions conference series. Thank you for listening. We hope you found it useful. I should also say a special thank you to our guest speaker, Richard Farr. If you submitted questions during the course of the webinar, we'll get back to you shortly. Alternatively, please feel free to contact any of us using the details shown on the screen. Thanks again, and we look forward to welcome you uh, once more in the near future.